Matthew's Gospel 28. Matthew's Gospel 28. And we're looking at the Spirit amongst us. The Spirit amongst us. We began that last week. All right, very quickly. Verse 18. So, how many places are you going to open to now? Huh? Two or three now? Is that four? He's four. <laughs> Matthew's Gospel 28, 18 to 20. All right. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All authority, that's what power, is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Verse 20. Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I'm with you always, even unto the end of the world or the age. Amen. Mark's Gospel 16 and verse 15. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. He that believes not shall be damned. Verse 17. And this sign shall follow them that believe in my name. They shall cast out demons. That's the word devils. They shall speak with new tongues. Verse 18. They shall take up serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing, they shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick. And the sick shall recover. Verse 19. So then after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven and sat on the right hand of God. Verse 20. And they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord walking with them, them italicized there, and confirming the word with signs following, and he says, Amen. And John 20, John 20, John 20, I'm going to start from verse 19. And the same day at the evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for the fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in the midst and said unto them, Peace be unto you. And when he had so said, he showed unto them his hands and his side. Then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. Then said Jesus to them, Peace be unto you, as my Father has sent me, even so send I you. And when he said this, he breathed on them, them is his eyes, and said unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Verse 23. Whosoever sins you remit, they are remitted unto them, and whosoever you retain, they are retained. Now, these are, as it were, what we call the Great Commission. This is uh, what we call the instruction that Jesus gave. Now, this is just an additional information. If you could just go to Matthew 10, verse 1 to about 8, even more than that, but I'm just summarizing that, but it goes to the later part of the chapter, and then also to Mark 6, uh, Mark 6, about verse 12 or so, verse, no, verse 9 through to 13. And then you also see Luke's Gospel 10, oh, sorry, 9, verse 1 to about uh, 10. You see that before this time, he had given them instructions like that also to go uh, and preach and, and all of that. So that's just an additional information. Now, in Luke's Gospel 25, 24, sorry, verse 25 to 27, we have um, that very unique encounter that Jesus had with the disciples when he met um, some of them or two of them, Cleopas, and likely to be his wife, and then he said to them in verse 25, O fools and slow of heart, Luke's Gospel 24, to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And begin at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Now verse 25 says he expounded unto them in all the scriptures, which is to interpret, to explain, to interpret, in all the scriptures, the things concern himself. Now go to Luke's Gospel again, 24, verse 44. Then he came and spoke to them and said, These are the words, verse 44, which I said to you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled, which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets and in Psalms concerning me. Now 45 says, Then he opened in their understanding, pay attention to that, that they might understand the scriptures. That they might understand the scriptures. Now that word understand is the word sui near me in the Greek, S-U-N-I-E-M-I. -E I told you before, it's two words. S-U-N in the Greek is together. 
Then the word nohima, N-O-E-M-A, to reason together, which means the scriptures ought to be read together. The scriptures ought to be read together. Also, that's why we've applied the same principle to the four Gospels. We have read the four accounts together. The Mark 16 account, the uh, Luke uh, 24, the one just read now, the account, the Matthew 28 account, then the John 20 account. Now, let's see something very similar. Now, first and foremost, don't forget, that Jesus is reading from which books now? Huh? This gospel? Huh? What it? Understands that word I read? No. He's reading from where? Genesis to Mark. Always pay attention to that, which means that we have a duty to always read the four Gospels with the Old Testament. I'll take that again. We have a duty to always read the four Gospels with the Old Testament. Old Testament. We also have a duty to always read the epistles with the four Gospels, definitely with the Old Testament. So pay, that, pay attention to that very well. Now, there's something you are going to see consistently in the four accounts that we read. In the four accounts. Let me take the Luke's account first. In the Luke's account, now one of the things I told you is to use Bible words for Bible expressions, right? Right? Don't read it in your world first. If you read it in your world, you're going to get it wrong. The moment you read it in your world, you get it wrong. You must read Bible words in Bible worlds, in the Bible language. Now look at Luke's Gospel 24. I'm going to read 49. You shall be endued with power from on high. From on high. Then verse 51. 51. He blessed them. And he was the pilot, or because he parted from them, and he carried up into heaven. Now look, look at that. On high, then heaven. Now, Look at Mark 16, the Mark's account. The Mark's account. Mark 16, 19. He was received up unto heaven. Just about what we read now in Luke's Gospel 24 and 51. Received up into heaven and did what? Well, come on, Mark 16, 19. Did what? Sat on the right hand of God. So when we read it together, when you say receive all the heaven, it means sat down, or I, I've got what I down, I'm gonna sat on the right hand of God. Now, if I say that in my world, if I say, um, Shego sat at my right hand. Now, the first thing it will mean is that when you look at me geographically speaking, he's gonna be at the right side of my body or wherever I am. But that is not what it means here. That's what it means in today's language, but that's not what it means. So we're going to see that too. Now go to Matthew 28. Matthew 28 and verse 18. All authority is given to me. Now, notice something in all the accounts. All authority is given to me in heaven and in earth. Okay? Then in verse 20, Lo, I'll come back and see you. Is that what he says? I am with you. Okay? So, that's a bit contradictory. He carried up into heaven. Now, if you say heaven now, what will come to my mind is that he left the earth, right? So he left there. So he's carried up into heaven. Then lo, I am with you. It's not a contradiction. It's a language problem. Okay? Lo, I'm with you. Now he says in Matthew 28, 18, all authority is given to me. Now in John 20, and verse 17, John 20, and verse 17, John 20, and verse 17. All right? <clears throat> and Jesus said unto her, Touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my Father. Go to my brethren and say unto them, I ascend 
to my father. Ascend. Is it a height? So we have four different accounts. Luke 24, 49, on high, heaven. Mark 16, 20, sat at the right hand of God in heaven. Matthew 28, 18, all authority in heaven and earth is given me. John 20, 17, I ascend to my father. So we must therefore, the first thing to understand is read this in the Old Testament. Is that very clear? Come on, am I making sense here? Read this first where? In the Old Testament. What does this mean in the Old Testament? The moment you know what it means in the Old Testament, then his words become clear. Jesus did not teach anything that cannot be understood in the Old Testament alone. Let me say it again for you to get it. He didn't teach anything that cannot be understood by only reading the Old Testament. So I told you, the Old Testament is self-explanatory. If it's well studied, if you follow the Suinemi principle of reading everything together. So let's back up and see one or two things. Now, Matthew gives us a very critical part. In Matthew's Gospel 28, he says, um, Jesus, verse 16, went away with the 11 disciples onto a mountain in Galilee. Now, we have done that study before. Is that mountain important? Come on. It's important because we said topography and geography is important in theology. Mountain of Galilee. Matthew 4, from 15, 16 or thereabout, you see how it's called Galilee of the Nations. It represents to give a commission. And mountains are critical in scripture. Abraham offered Isaac figuratively on Mount Moriah. Genesis 22. Same mountain. Solomon will build a temple. Moses got called by God and he gave the law in the mountain. Mount Horeb, Mount Sinai, very Mount Zion. So the Mount of Galilee of the nations, which means that this is for the whole world. So by saying go into all the nations, they understood it by the location they were at. He used location to teach. So location is important. When you are studying scripture, pay attention to where the statement was said. Because location was used to explain. Where was the statement made? The Old Testament, I meant, and of course the four Gospels. Now, look at that Matthew 28. All authority in heaven and earth is given me. We must therefore read this from the Old Testament. Go to Daniel. Daniel 7. Daniel 7, verse 13. I saw in the night visions, Daniel 7, 13, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven and came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. Let's read verse 14 together. And there was given him, I'll wait for you, let's go over it again. And there was given him dominion, glory, and a kingdom, and all people, nations, languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom which shall not be destroyed. This is exactly what Matthew said Jesus did. Matthew is not quoting Jesus verbatim. Matthew is summarizing what Jesus taught. All authority is given in heaven according to Daniel 7. So pay attention to locations. I mentioned that earlier. Look at Matthew 22. Matthew 22. Now, the background of this information, of this uh, scenario, pardon me, was that someone came to Jesus and said, what is that great commandment of the law? Matthew 22, 36. And then Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all your heart and might and soul. Um, in verse 37. Though I will cancel that you go to the Luke's rendering, sorry, the Mark's rendering, Mark 12, where he first of all gave the background, because that statement is from Deuteronomy 6 and 5. He gave the background of Deuteronomy 6 and 4. Here, O Israel, the Lord your God is one. Mark 12, verse 28 through to verse 31. Lord your God is one. 
You see that in the coming days. I, I intend before the camp meeting to either teach so great salvation. Is it somewhere on eight now? Huh? Eight. It's eight now. So eight, either before camp meeting or law in Genesis, one of the two. So we're going to explore that text uh, more, 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 than, more, more than that. Okay, so he says, then when that conversation was done, while the Pharisees, listen carefully now, notice in verse 35. Now, then one of them, are you there? Okay, let's start from 34. When the Pharisees heard that he had put the Pharisees to silence, they were gathered together, and one of them, which was, forget that one, asked him, why do you laugh? Is it not in italics? A question tempting him. Look at the word tempting him. Now, go again to uh, before tempting him. Then in um, verse 41, they gather together and just ask them, Who think ye Christ? Whose son is he? Then they said, David. Then he said unto them, because one of the names of the Messiah is son of David, based on the promise God made to David in 2 Samuel 7. Then he says, how doth David then in the spirit call him Lord, saying the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right, on my right hand till I make thine enemies thy footstool. If David then calls him Lord, how is he his son? That was the conversation there. How is he his son? Now I want you to notice something in Mark 12. Where did that conversation take place? Mark 12, 35. The same rendering, Mark gives us an important detail. Let's go. And Jesus answered and said, while he taught where? So pay attention to the temple. While he taught in the temple. Don't forget our subject is the spirit amongst us. While he taught in the temple. So he taught in the temple and affirmed that Christ is the son of David in the temple. In Luke's Gospel 20, Luke's Gospel 20 and 41, same conversation through to 44. Now, pay attention to the temptation of Jesus. Now, I've told you that the temptation of Jesus is not a movie. He goes to the temple, sorry, he goes to the de desert and then Satan says, hello, hi, I want to tempt you. Okay, go ahead. If you are the son of God, turn the stone of bread. <laughs> I know you say that. That's not a temptation, that's a movie. But if you look at Matthew's rendering, you discover that temptation happened as Jesus was amongst people. Matthew 4. Matthew 4. The tempter came to him, verse 3. Now, when it says the tempter came to him, have you noticed that every time the Pharisees had those devious conversations with Jesus, they were called tempting him. Do you notice it? Do you notice it? They tempted him. So the temptations of Jesus came amongst men. Pay attention here. So, look at verse 5. And the devil takes him into where? Into where? The holy city, Jerusalem. And set him on the pinnacle of where again? Where again? The temple. So, it was moving. It was in his activities. Now, notice something that Jesus consistently called the Pharisees. Matthew's Gospel, 23 Verse 33. Don't forget, we are reading the Old Testament in the life of Jesus. Matthew 23, 33. Let's go. You what? Serpents. Come on. Are you there? You generation of vipers. Ophis in the Greek, O-P-H-I-S. You serpents. So, Jesus... I thought serpent is the devil. Genesis 3, yeah, I know. But it says you serpents. He calls them serpents. In Matthew 7, this is very critical. 
Matthew 7. Verse 10. If he asks for fish, will he give him a serpent? Serpent. I'm not sure you've ever asked God for fish. <laughs> Jesus is using Old Testament language. Will he give him a serpent? In Matthew 10, verse 16. I want us to read that one together. Let's go. Behold, let's go. I send you forth a sheep in the midst of wolves. Where are they going to the forest? Huh? Amongst people, right? Let's take it again. Behold, I send you forth a sheep in the midst of what? And I have to explain this to you. They are as wise as who? They are as wise, cunning as serpents. So, Luke 10, 19, I give you power to tread upon serpents and scorpions over all the power of the enemy. Serpents and scorpions, that refers to what again? The activities of the devil. Mark 16, 18, you shall take up serpents. Hmm. Now, John 3, 14, as... Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so shall the Son of Man be lifted up. So, Jesus was killed by men, right? Come on. Ah, so shall the Son of Man be lifted up. Caused to die, then be raised from the dead. That's what it means. Lifted up from the serpent. Now, we're looking at that word serpent. 1 Corinthians 10 Verse 9, literal serpents here, because you can find the account. Neither let us tempt Christ, as some of them were, were also tempted, and were destroyed. Look at the word tempt. Were destroyed of serpents. Exodus 17, verse 2 and 7. Destroyed of serpents. Now look at 2 Corinthians chapter 11. I probably let one text, let, I, I, let, I let it uh, alone can come back there. Sir Corinthians 11 and verse 3. Let's go. Sir Corinthians 11 verse 3. Are you there? Let's go. But I fear, lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ Jesus. And what is he referring to? He's referring to false teaching. Revelation 12, 9. Revelation 12, 9. Revelation 12, 9. And the great dragon was cast out, the old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceives the whole world. Revelation 12, 9. The great serpent great dragon, the old serpent. And it says, which accuses them, verse 10, before God daily. They overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they were not, didn't love their lives unto death. Now you can see that again in Revelation uh, 12, 14, serpent. Revelation 9, 19, and 20, verse 2. 20 and verse 2. So, when you read serpent, you shouldn't go to snakes. Is that clear? I know I've eaten snakes here before. In this whole church. Thank you. You were first reluctant. So I'll come and cast out demons from you. I've taken snakes before. I think it sounds like, it tastes like fish or something. Yeah. <laughs> so I say, ha! <laughs> you ate the devil. It makes it better. Now, so look at Luke 11. So when you say serpent, it was a serpentine spirit. Luke 11, 
I left that out deliberately. Now, when Jesus was talking about asking the Father, he asked us to ask the Father for the kingdom. So how does he describe the kingdom? He says, if, verse 11, if a son shall ask bread of any of you that is a father, will he give him a stone? If he asks for fish, will he for fish give him a serpent? If he asks for an egg, will he give him a scorpion? Look at 13. If you then being evil, know how to what? Give good gifts unto your children. How much shall the heavenly father give the Holy Spirit? So that means the language is figurative. Give the Holy Spirit. So the exact opposite of the serpent is who? The Holy Spirit. So the serpent is not a snake. So therefore, <clears throat> when Jesus called them in Matthew 23, verse 33, when he says, you are serpents, that means he wants us to look for the serpent where? In man. Is that very clear? Come on, is that clear? Let me see how you're following this. Come on. Come on, let me see your hand. Come on, let me see. Is it clear to you? Look for the serpent in man. It says you are vipers. That word viper is the word ada in another language. A-double-D-E-R. It refers to deadly poison. Matthew 3, 7. Matthew 3, 7. Look at John the Baptist again. He calls the Pharisees, oh, generation of vipers. Vipers. Matthew 12, 34. Oh, Jesus says, it, oh, generation of vipers, how can you, being evil, speak good things? So, which means that we know serpents and vipers by what they say. So in Psalm 91, very vitally, it's not for you to enter the zoo, Psalm 91, the secret place of the Most High. He says in verse 13, thou shalt tread tre 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 upon the lion and the adder. Other refers to poisonous words. So you shall tread upon serpents and scorpions. You shall tread upon poisonous words. So when we read words in scripture, we must read words with Bible language. Don't give it your own definition. Stick with or to Bible language. So therefore, what this tells us is that Whatever we read in Genesis 3 was not a snake coming to Eve or Adam. The serpent is found in human interactions. Human interactions, human behavior, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. So serpent, like I said before, many of us, what has influenced us very heavily are the books we read in our primary school, Bible stories. And then by the time we are teaching Genesis 3, you are still seeing a woman, Apu, and particularly Red Apu. And then you are seeing um, the serpent speaking. No, the Bible isn't written that way. The Bible is written for you to understand the Bible in the Bible language. Okay? So when it says serpents, vipers, there are times where literal, just like when Paul's hands was fastened upon by a viper in Matthew 20, uh, so Acts 28. That was literal. But again, it's figurative. <laughs> Don't mind me. Then you have the vipers or the serpents that refer to men. Persecution, deception, opposition to God's counsel is called a serpent. Deception. So, when Jesus was tempted, he was tempted through who? Come on. Through who? Satan has never come to anyone to tempt him before. Satan walks through men. 
So Jesus was tempted by the Pharisees, Sadducees. So therefore, when we read, don't forget we started from a premise. The premise we started from is what does it mean to sit at the right hand of God? Or to sit or to be on high? You know, what does it mean? Someone was saying, someone said, yeah, when, you, when you're hooked on the most high, you'll be high. You know? I, I said, you are really high. <laughs> Nonsense. So what does it mean to sit down at the right hand of God? Now, do not forget that in Matthew 22, when Jesus spoke about the Christ, the text we read earlier, which is also in Mark 12 and Luke 20, he says, whose son is the Christ? And then they said, the son of David. Then he said, why does David in the spirit call him Lord? Matthew 22, then 44. The Lord said unto my Lord, that Jesus is referencing Psalm 110 verse 1. Sit on my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. Sit on my right hand. Okay, when we say seat, for example, when we say seat, what is in your mind is this lovely brother sitting here. No, no, stand up. You want to stand up? I say sit down, you're standing. Ah, be careful. Serpent. <laughs> <laughs> or serpentine spirit. Let me see who have. You should have serpentine spirit. You're yellow, right? That's serpentine spirit. Don't be too black. It's a spiritual problem. Don't be too yellow. So, it's seated. So, I say, seated around of God, of God, you think it means that Jesus, um, he just relaxed. He's relaxed. His two hands like this. Like you are crossing your leg. Don't stay there. Don't change it. And I go in. So, wow. And the father is in the middle. So who's on the left hand? Sometimes some people say Satan. That's nice. Then the Holy Spirit is. He doesn't stay in one place. <laughs> That's not what it means. All right. <laughs> Psalm 110 verse 1. That means that the word right hand is from Psalm 110 verse 1. Is that clear? Come on. All right. Psalm 110, verse 1. So we have a right to go back there and understand the meaning. Psalm 110, verse 1. Don't forget we're looking at the Spirit amongst us. And the Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. The word here is the word yamin, Y-A-M-I-N. It is an idiom. Or an idiomatic expression. Sometimes it's literal. But a whole lot of times the theology of it is done in an idiom. An idiomatic expression. For example, when I say that the... Um, let me look for an idiom now. I'm trying to get one quickly. Look at Exodus 15. Exodus 15 and verse 6. I want us to read it together. Well, let us start from verse 1. Then sang Moses and the children of Israel this song to the Lord and spake, saying, I will sing unto the Lord. He had triumphed gloriously. The horse and the rider hath he thrown into the sea. That's the Red Sea experience. And the Lord is my strength and song. He's become my salvation. He is my God. How I prepare him an habitation my father's God, and I'll exalt him. The Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. Pharaoh's chariots and his host are he cast into the sea. His chosen captains also had drowned in the sea, Red Sea. Let's take five and slow into six. Let's go. The depths have covered them. They have sunk in the bottom as a stone. Six and slowly. Thy right hand, O Lord, is become glorious in power. Thy right hand, O Lord, are dashed in pieces the enemy. So right hand is for what? Exploit. Right? Come on. Show of power. 
Is that clear? Come on. Let me see if you understand that. Show of power. Look at verse 12. Thy, thou strike out thy right hand. Let's take 11. Who is like unto thee, O Lord? Amongst the gods, who is like thee, glorious and honest, fearful in praises, doing wonders? Thy stretched out thy right hand, they are swallowed them, thou in thy mercy led forth the people, thou shalt redeem, thou guide them in strength in thy holy habitation. So, I don't think what you think he's saying is that they saw the feast of God like this. Okogan, show me your power. Another one is a miracle. You know that song? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. Use your right hand, use your right hand, use your right hand. Get. Hey, no, one blow, seven die. No. He's <laughs> referring to the show of power. Verse 17. No, no, not verse 17, sorry. Hold on. Verse 17, yeah, sorry. Thou shalt bring them in the plant. All right? In the inheritance in the place which thou hast made for thee to dwell in, in the sanctuary, O Lord, thy hands have established it. Thy hands have established it. So it is the show of power. So let's notice if Moses writes it and uses that phrase in the Exodus, then it also must be found where? Talk to me, guys, where? In Genesis. So, where is he getting this from? Genesis 48. Genesis 48. Because before a word is used figuratively, we must see it in a literal form. It's first literal, then becomes figurative, because the literal is usually the history, then the figurative is the theology behind it. The literal is the history, the theology is now found in the figurative expression. Now, I'm going to teach about that in the second service on the codified use of language. Now, see this. Genesis 48. This is Jacob blessing the children of Joseph. Verse 9. These are my sons whom the Lord has given me. I pray I will bless them. And then he asks his father to bless his kids. Now look at what the father does in 13. And Joseph took them both, Ephraim, in his right hand towards Israel's left hand and Manasseh, Genesis 48 verse 13, in his left hand towards Israel's left hand, right hand and he brought them there. So it was literal. Okay now, the seated brother come. You come. Too. Serpentine spirit. So. <laughs> you come. So, which means he, I'm see, so come, come to Joseph. At last, did you dream? You dream a lot. Come, come. No, you, no, 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 you, you, you turn right. These are your kids. I hope so. You, you brought the two children, but they're they're boys. Okay, so I'm just pretend you're a boy. Okay, so <laughs> we don't have time. So, um, you bring your kids to me. I'm. Jacob, but can see. Okay, so you bring, <laughs> you bring both of them, and then you say, you expect me to use my right on him and my left on him, her. <laughs> right? So that's what he expects. Why did he do that? Because it is a cultural meaning. Do you get it? It's a cultural meaning. Now, don't go anywhere yet. Just hold on. Joseph and his children. Now, what does he do? Israel then stretched his right hand and laid it upon Ephraim's head, who was the younger, and his left hand, and he guided his hands. He goes like this. He crosses his hands. Why would he do that? Which means it is a cultural meaning. It has a symbolic meaning. He crosses his hands. Go back now quickly. All right? He crossed his hands and he put his hand up on his head. This is where you have the doctrine of laying on of hands. Now, don't, don't run if I use my left hand. You say, Pastor, what have I done wrong? 
<laughs> Don't get that wrong. So he blessed them. He blessed Joseph and said, God before whom? Now, pay attention to verse 17. When Joseph saw that his father laid his right hand on the head of Ephraim, he displeased him. He held up his father's hand and he moved it from his father's his Ephraim's head to Manasseh's head. And he said unto his father, no, 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 my father, for this is the firstborn. Put thy right hand upon his head. And his father said, I know it, my son. I know it. He also shall become a people. He shall be great. But truly his younger brother shall be greater. His seed shall be a multitude of nations. Look at He said, this is my firstborn. Which means that the right hand is where you show your power are where you put your rights and privileges. Who's following this? Come on. So the right hand is also used for the firstborn. Firstborn, which is where you have the word bekor and bakora in the Hebrew, is one who continues your legacy. So when Moses says, by your right hand you treasure Israel, it means that they to continue your legacy in the earth. So the concept of right hand, the concept of right hand refers to the show of power. It also refers to right, privilege, and inheritance. Are you following? Are you following this? This is chapter 6. And verse 4. Put, put that somewhere. Then go back to Psalm 110 verse 1. So the Lord said to my Lord. Now the Hebrew is that Yahweh said to Adonai. Sit, because when he says sit at my right hand, that means you are giving your glory to, right? Is that clear? Passing your privileges and rights. So, Yahweh, this is the king. David is the one prophesying. Yahweh, who is the God of Israel and the whole world, this is Romans 6 and 4, who is one Lord. Yeah, oh Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord Yahweh Elohim, the Lord who is your God, he's one Lord, a card. That's a doctrine that already explains what we call the Trinity today. So David is looking into God and he says, this is a king. A king has no master. Why would he now say, the Lord, that's fine, Yahweh said to my Lord, my master, who did the king call his master? Same Yahweh. Who's following this? Come on. Who is the master of the king? Yahweh. So by saying, the Lord said to my Lord, is letting us see that there are persons in God. The Lord said to my Lord. Now, Hebrew scholars have said, it literally actually is, Yahweh said to Yahweh, sit at my right hand. Now, this will baffle the Jews, because that's what Jesus asked them and said, who son is he? They said, David, if he's his son, why does he call him Lord? And then at that point, they kept quiet. <laughs> you notice that this is what broke Paul down on the road to Damascus. The moment is, Paul wasn't an, wasn't an ignoramus when it comes to scriptures. He knew the scriptures. But when he saw Jesus on the road to Damascus, I am Jesus whom you persecute. He had come face to face with God like Moses. So he knew that the man that was crucified is God himself. That event changed his entire interpretation of scriptures. Paul. And David is saying here, the Lord said to my Lord, sit down at my show of power, right? Sit down at my inheritance. Come on. Come on, sit down at what I'm doing, correct? Sit down. So the word seat, 
Psalm 110 verse 1. Does it mean to put your butts somewhere? No, it means to settle. It means to inhabit. It also means to expand. In Genesis chapter 4 and verse 16 is used for Cain. Genesis 4 and 16. The Bible is having a problem. Looking for Gen... Okay. Sorry, sorry. I'm trying to get the word of God right. Hmm. The word of God is missing. <laughs> okay. Okay. Cain went and dwelt. The word dwelt. To dwell. So the word seed, yashab, means to dwell. It doesn't just say that. It also means from there, you now begin to expand and you settle there. Sit at my right hand. What does it mean? Dwell in my power continually, right? Dwell in my inheritance. Is that what it is? Come on. So, Jesus sitting at the right hand of God is not the right side of his body. Is that very clear? Come on. You understand what it means now? Now you have people who have had visions and they've gone to heaven. They said they went to heaven and saw God in the middle and saw Jesus at the right hand. And as they wanted to look at God, Jesus said, if you try it, you will die and go where? <laughs> you know, sometimes your visions are informed by your revelation. That's what happened there. So the truth is, God said to God. Which means that Psalm 110 verse 1 already prophesies that God will become a man. He will be lesser than God at some point. And this is exactly what happened in the resurrection. So, look at another Psalm, Psalm 45. One say, we bow before your throne. That song's like that, right? There's another song like, uh, um, there's a song like, we bow before, give me one of these bow. No, the one we sing here, don't come and sing one celestial song here, I'm saying. You know, there's one, down at your feet, oh Lord, is the most high place. In your presence, Lord, I seek your face. I see your, and we say, say, down at your feet, oh Lord. How can his feet be the most high place? Is it upside down? I mean, that's what it means now. You gotta know what it means. So say throne, we bow before your throne, oh God. So your mind, you see, sliver. No, sliver, the sliver. <laughs> sliver, sliver plated, oh God. See the throne shining. Ah, ah. Egbe ade obarewa. That's bring the crown of his kingdom. Put it on his head. Coronation ceremony. <laughs> <laughs> Hallelujah. Psalm 45, are you in church? <laughs> Verse 6. Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of thy kingdom is the right scepter. Thou lovest righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, even thy God, has not let even the oil of godness above thy fellows. Throne. Where do you get thrown from? The word thrown simply means the word kise. K-I-S-S-E-H. It means to sit. The place where you sit. The place of your sitting. Because the kingdom, pay attention, the kingdom is the rule. The throne is where you sit in the rule. But you see, the word throne was first found in Egypt. Genesis 41. And verse 40. When Pharaoh said today, uh, uh, Joseph, 
Thou shalt be over my house. According to thy word shall all my people be ruled. Only in the throne will I be greater than you. Only in the throne seat of power will I be greater than you. You know, it's not referring to the size or the height of the seats. Only in authority will I be greater than you. So, now look at 2 Samuel chapter 7. So, throne does not refer to chair. Is that clear? Is it making sense? Aha. 2 Samuel, we must be careful to not to have idols, images in our minds. 2 Samuel 7. Watch God's promise to David. In 12, I will set up your seed after you. The word quom, I hope I'm right. If I'm wrong, you correct it later. Quom, I will set up your seed after you. It means to raise up. Second Samuel 7, 12. We shall proceed out of thy bowels, and I will establish his kingdom. I will raise up. Now, if he's talking about his physical child, he will use the word raise up. So the word raise is the word agario in the Greek. It means to raise from the dead. I'll raise up thy seed after thee, which shall proceed out of thy bowels, and I'll establish what? Second Samuel 7, 12. I'll establish what? His kingdom. Now let's slowly read verse 13. Let's go. It shall build a house for my name. I'll wait for you. Let's do it again. Come on. It shall build a house for my name. I will establish the throne of his kingdom. Does it mean I will put his seat to be somewhere forever? No. I will establish his authority. Forever. His authority. Forever. Verse 16. Thy throne shall be established forever. So this was what God said to David. Then he prophesied. Thy throne, O God. Is forever. No, no, that's Psalm 45, 6, sorry. That the Lord said to my Lord, sit down at thy right hand till I make thine enemies thy footstool. So, the seat of authority and power is also used for priests. 4 Samuel 1, 9 and 4. 4 Samuel 1, verse 9, sorry. 4 Samuel 1, verse 9. 4 Samuel 4, 13 and 18. 4 Samuel 1, verse 9. Then one, then four, thirteen, and eighteen. So when we refer to throne, we're referring to a seat of power. So we bow before your throne. Not a wrong word, song to sing. We we bow we, before your throne. That is, we bow at your resurrection. We bow at your glory. We're not, we don't, when we say we bow before your throne, we are not looking at a chair. We bow at your resurrection. We bow at your display of power. We bow at your right hand, correct? At your inheritance, correct? What about at your salvation? Is that correct too? Very good. So therefore, when they said Jesus was received up in the heaven and sat at the right hand, that right hand, is it in a planet or amongst men? Amongst men. Because that is where the right hand is seen. You see the right hand of God. You see it. The right hand of God is seen. The right hand of God is what he's doing. The right hand of God is amidst people. So in John 20, and verse 17, I ascend to my Father. I ascend. Anabino in the Greek, A-N-A-B-A-N-A. I, -N -O. I ascend 
Two words. Two words. I ascend to the Father. There are two words in there. Anabasis, A-N-A-B-A-S-I-S. I ascend to the Father. Now check the Greek word here. When I said I ascend to my Father, it's the word proston patera. Pay attention here. Towards the Father. Towards. Which means Jesus is describing his resurrection and the inheritance that followed. I ascend to the Father. Now, this is an important fact because it was only Mary who had this fact. Mary Magdalene. Now, let me give you what we would have thought he meant. She looked out for him from the grave. He, she didn't see him. Then she saw him and said, Oh, Mary, wrap up with me. Oh, you want to hug me? Oh, don't hug me yet. Don't spoil this thing. If you spoil it, you know how people go to Abalis and they say, it must not touch me. If you touch me, the, the sacrifice will be spoiled. Imagine if Mary had touched him there. The blood would have been contaminated. And when Mary comes before the Father, we need the blood. He said, ah! <laughs> the Father is saying, what did you just do? Woman. <laughs> Again? <laughs> but you see, in the Greek, she had actually touched him. She had hugged him. So the Greek is, don't hold me any further. I ascend. Now, let us, let us behave like Bible illiterates again. That means, hold on, are they come? Right? I ascend. I ascend. Hold on. See, this is Tito Gate. I've not yet got in there. They will get there first. Tell us, no one tell me I to wait for me, are they come? Now, look at what John writes here. Verse 19, the same day. Right? <laughs> the same day. So all the events are together. I ascend. Now, when we see ascend, is he talking about an height or God's show of power? Hey, God is about to do something. That's the word I ascend to my father. And we have seen right hand where he ascended to refers to what God is doing where? Amongst us. Go tell them that I'm about to do something in their midst. So she went there, took the message there first before the action. So I ascend, Jesus was not going away. I ascend means I'm coming to you. Let me see if you understand that. Is that clear? I ascend. It was, I'm coming to you. So being seated at the right hand refers to God's work through Christ to us. And so when you read the Greek word of it, I think it's the word dextios, it must be uh, no. Yeah, dextios. And the word katarizo. They must not be given meaning outside the Old Testament explanation. Hebrews chapter 1. You learning something? Are you learning something? Yes, sir. Hebrews 1. Verse 8. Unto the Son, he saith, thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. Is, is he a chair? Huh? No. Thy throne, O God. Look at the background of that study. That background of that study is in verse 3. When he had by himself purged our sins and sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. Being made much better. Verse 5. When he 
brought again the firstborn into the world. Verse 6, let all the angels worship him. He is describing the resurrection of Jesus. Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. Can we, see your, can we say your resurrection is forever and ever? Would that be correct? Would that be correct? Your resurrection is forever. So that was why when he came to them in John 20, this is the ascension, John 20. Let us see that ascension. That ascension is not a departure. John 20, verse 19. Look at the key words here. In verse 1, the first day of the week, John 21. The first day of the week. John 20 verse 1. The first day of the week. John 20 verse 19. The same day at the, be, at the evening. Being the first day of the week. What does he come to say to them? Aaron, I'm on. Shalom in the Greek. In the Hebrew, Aaron in the Greek. That means union. Shalom means we are together. Union unto you. Whose union? God's union to you. And they were glad they saw the Lord. Then he said, peace unto you again. Has my father sent me? Look at the ascension. Has my father sent me? Even so send I you. Then he breathed on them. Or breathed on the word emphasis. It means he brought life to their hearts. That is the ascension. He breathed on them. The ascension is Christ dwelling in them. I ascend I ascend to my Father and your Father. I ascend to my God, your God. In other words, I will dwell in you. That's the word ascension. And how is he doing it? By the Spirit. That's why the four Gospels did not capture that ascension. What captured that ascension is the epistles. The epistles writes the facts of that ascension. The four Gospels write the events around it. Listen carefully. The book of Acts writes the actions of it. Book of Acts, the actions. The epistles, the facts of it. And then the four Gospels, the events around it. So Jesus says, peace unto you. Has my father sent me, even so send I you. So the first thing he does in his resurrection is to dwell in them. Is that right? Is that correct? Come on. Come on. So as he said, peace unto you, and they saw him, he was living in them. God has the capacity to be here and there. As he spoke to them, receive ye the Holy Ghost before he said that, and he breathed on, he came to dwell in them. But we still saw Jesus. Well, he's God. Hallelujah. Because he said to them, in that day, you will know that I am in the Father. And you in me, John 14, verse 20, and I in you. I pray the Father, give you another comforter. John 14, 6, now you may abide with you forever. Even the Spirit of truth will walk and receive because it dwells in him. But you dwell in him, with him, it dwells with you and shall be where in you. So that day had come, and John was clear. That day, the first day, being the same day. Is that clear? Come on. Hallelujah. In his resurrection, there will be what? An ascension. That ascension is like this. That means the ascension of Christ is this way, right? Come on now. Are you there? Is that the right hand? Is that the right hand? God's display of power is salvation, is inheritance. It comes like this. When we say ascension to us, it's like this. But God's ascension is to descend and live in man. Let me see your hand, come on. Is it making sense? Very good. So, in Genesis chapter 1, quickly. I have some time. So, you read Bible words using Bible explanations. Genesis chapter 1. I must do something about this. My Bible is really scattered, really. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void. We're looking at the spirit in our midst. Without form and void. 
And the darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light. So we have the Spirit and the light. And when we refer to waters, if you read the scriptures afterwards, as the waters cover the sea, refers to nations. So Genesis 1-2, the Spirit of God desiring the nations. Genesis 1-3 is going to be by preaching. God said, let there be light. And this is what is going on now in the world. This is what is happening. From Genesis 2 to Malachi, through to the book of Revelation until now, this is what God is doing. So let's look at something that we said last week. Isaiah 53. Are you learning something? Come on, church. You learning something? Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53 and verse 1. Who had believed that report? In whom is the hand of the Lord revealed? We're looking at the sacrifice of Jesus. What did he do with it? So we, we were in verse 10. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He had put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, Zerah, and prolong his days, the word Salak. That was there last week in our study. It will advance. He will see his seed. Seed is usually what comes after you. Then he says he will prolong his days. He will see his seed and prolong his days. Pay attention there. And the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. So which means the resurrection is what God did with the death of Jesus. And what did he do with the resurrection? He will prolong his days. In other words, there's an expansion going on. God is doing things in the earth. We're used to the word finished work of Christ. And that's lovely. The finished work of Christ, it's done. We're forgiven. We're sanctified. But you see, Jesus is not, how do I put it? He's not a lazy savior. He's not a laid back one. He has not retired. He's an ongoing one. The right hand is an ongoing work. Right hand is an ongoing work. We, mean, we said the other times, it means to settle. It means to expand. And you look at Paul and the writer of Hebrews. The writer of Hebrews says in Hebrews 10, 12 and 14, he waits till his enemies be made his footstool. It's going on. An ongoing work there. First Corinthians 12 and 15, Paul 26 to 27, Paul says that the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. That means it's an ongoing work. The right hand is what God is still doing in the earth today. He will see his seed and prolong his days. And what is his days? What's that prolonging? Genesis 1, 2. All the waters or all the nations. Why do they use waters, land? I told you that last week. It's because they are agrarian in culture. Not agrarian, I made that mistake last week. Agrarian, agrarian. That is because what they, they could only understand spiritual things by using agriculture. So land was used. Land because they were farmers. So if you want to tell them about something that is precious, use garden. What is precious? Garden. What is in the garden? A little fine girl, sorry. What is in the garden? The tree of life. The spirit of God. Or can we say the presence of God? Hallelujah. So when they got to Egypt, now pay attention, they got to Egypt. Now land wasn't that special anymore in Egypt because they had filled the land. What was special in Egypt? A temple where they put their idols. So what again? God now uses what again? Temple. Land, temple. And it's still the same thing. When he told them, he's taking them to a land that he has showed this, their fathers. He said, so that there I will be with you. Temple. Tabernacle. David will say, Psalm 132. Psalm 132. Psalm 132. Verse 8. Oh, verse 8. Arise, O Lord, into your resting place. Menuka, your resting place. 
So we have all those words. All those words. God's resting place is not a place. <laughs> God's temple also is not a house. God's land also is not an acre. Whether it's temple, land, resting place, it refers to a people. People, nations. Nations. So in Genesis 1, 26 to 28, he says to fill the earth, fill the earth, fill it up. And that word fill, male in the Greek or mala, M-A-L-E or M-A-L-A, refers to the glory of God. Psalm 72. Psalm 72. Psalm 72. And verse 19. I'll start from 18. Blessed be the Lord God, the God of Israel, who only does wondrous things. And blessed be the, his glorious name forever. And let the whole earth be filled with his glory. Be filled with his glory. Be filled with his glory. Numbers 14, 21. As I leave, the whole earth shall be filled with my glory as the waters, what? Covers the sea. Habakkuk 2, 14. Psalm 11, verse 9. So which means, now look up now, this is vital. This is vital. The temple of God is what? A place or a people? Pay attention. The promised land, a place or a people? Very good. Is it making sense? Is it making sense? Now, where? Which people? From all the earth. So which means God's temple is always expanding. God's land is always what? Expanding. That is the right hand. Always expanding. As we go from place to place, as we go from city to city, town to town, and we share about the goodness of God, the graciousness of Christ, what are we doing? We're expanding what? His temple. That fellow comes in. That woman, they come in. So, our idea of temple, which means for God to live inside, will be for a people. So let's quickly go to Mark 11. I asked you the last time to pay attention to the conversations that Jesus had in the temple. Can you remember? So which means that whenever he was in the temple, he deliberately made that conversation because of what we're about to see. So the physical location is part of his teaching and parables and illustrations. In Mark 11, Mark 11, he says, My father's house shall be called a house of prayer of all nations, but you have made it a den of thieves of all nations. Isaiah 56 and verse 7. My father's house is in the temple. So he calls it my father's huikios, family, dwelling place. Hebrew, be'ith, B-A-Y-T-H, B-A-Y-I-T-H, my father's house. Now notice what he says, look up, look up on this, this, this button. He says, shall be made a house of prayer for where? Which house could they have built for every nation? house. You can't even, if you can't even, which, the temple that Sol Solomon built, can he even take people in Yaba? Who's following what I'm saying here? It's a house of prayer for all nations. So to even imagine he's referring to a physical building means you are not really smart spiritually. A house of prayer for all nations. That means the house will be so large that everybody will be in. Hallelujah. Is that very clear? For all nations. Now, let's see. Genesis 28. Let 
This is Jacob. Jacob had this encounter. In verse 12, he dreamed and behold a ladder. That's the word, same word for Tower of Babel. A ladder set upon the earth and he reached up to heaven. Can you see it now? Come on. Can you see it? Verse 12. Genesis 11. Tower of Babel. They were to build up a house to reach up to heaven. Genesis 11. A tower, a city, whose top may reach unto heaven. Genesis 11 verse 4. Genesis 28 verse 12. To reach up to heaven, behold, the angels of God ascending and descending on it. And look at what God says. I am the Lord God of Abraham, your fa the father, and the God of Isaac. The land you lie is to, I will give to you and to your seed. Now, let us take verse 14 together. I'm very critically slow. Let's go. And thy seed shall be as what? And thou shalt spread abroad to the west, to the east, to the north, to the south. In the, and in, the, in thy seed shall where? So, this tower will have one family there. One nation. Huh? All the families. I am with you. And so when Jacob woke up, he said in 16, the Lord is in this place and I knew it not. He says, how dreadful is this place? No other but the house of God, the gate of heaven, Bethel. Beyeth and El, the house of God. So, listen carefully now. <laughs> what did Jacob see? That God will dwell in that place or in the old earth? Huh? Come on. In the old earth. He said he saw angels ascending and descending. So look at John's Gospel 155. Hallelujah. I said hallelujah. You learning something? John's Gospel? 155. That's 55. I meant 51. Let's go. Now. And he said unto him, Go, verily, verily, I say unto you, ere after, go on, you shall see heaven open, and the angels upon who? Is that the same scripture? Was Jesus referring to Jacob's encounter? Come on. So, who did Jacob see? Who did Jacob see? Jesus. Who did Jacob have that encounter with? God. He called it the house of God. Jesus said, the angels are sending this on me. Hallelujah. Is it making sense? Is it making sense here? <laughs> Is it making sense? On me. So, in the resurrection of Jesus, he says, go into all the world. Make disciples of every nation. Means that God is faithful. Hallelujah. He has kept his word. You know, you know, you know, in, in John's account of that, what Jesus said in the temple, he said, destroy this temple after three days. Remember? I will raise it up. So what he's saying, in other words, is take out this one. This is not what we're talking about. Hallelujah. <laughs> after three days. So in the resurrection of Jesus, what we have now found is God has raised his own temple. Shall I say his own people? Come on. His own nation. And that nation is a house of prayer for every nation. So the concept of temple must never be a place, 
It's a people. Quickly, let me run through this. Just like the Sabbath. The Sabbath day, Genesis 2 verse 1 to 3, I may explore that next week, refers to what God will do in the whole earth. It's also a resting place of God. Psalm 132 verse 8, we read that earlier. The same psalmist in Psalm 95 verse 11 says it's a day. A rest day, a rest place. Isaiah 66 verse 1, where is the place of my rest? So the Sabbath is a place, come on, is also a day. A time is also a place. It's a day, it's a place. In Isaiah 66 verse 1, he says, where is the place of my rest that you build? And I explored that word for us the other time, not this series. Bana, B-A-N-A-H. The word build there has to do with to rebuild, to remodel. Isaiah 66 verse 1 is used in the scriptures for man. Genesis 2.22. For a city. Genesis 4.17. For an altar. Genesis 8.20. So the house of God refers to a city, a people. It refers to mankind. It also refers to a place of worship. So when Jesus says, destroy this temple, after three days, I will build it. In other words, I will have a people of worship, a people of worship, a people of prayer, a people that I will dwell in, I will raise it again. All nations. Hallelujah. So which means that the spirit of God amongst us, hear me, is a proof that God is bringing everyone to himself. Everyone. There's no one that is disqualified. Because we read last week, remember? We said that Jesus, according to Isaiah 56, he healed the sick and made them welcome. Can you remember that last week? Can you remember last week? He welcomed them in. So the temple of God is where everybody's what? Welcome. The temple of God, the house of God, is God's spirit making a home everywhere in every place. In Genesis 28, what did Jacob see? All the earth. That means all peoples. So when Solomon was about to build Let's see his prayer. First Kings 8. Hallelujah. The giving of the Spirit is proof of Genesis 1 2. In all the waters, in all the nations, God's manifestation is with every kind of person. Now, I want to say this. I hope I have time today. When we refer to nations, sometimes we restrict nations to tribes. When you talk about cultural tribes, Yoruba, Aouza, Igbo, French. But nations also refer to people of the same kind of ideas. We have people like, we have those who presently, listen now, that atheists, they're a tribe. We have cultists, they're a tribe. We have the poor. We have the downcast. And God is bringing everyone, hallelujah, into that temple. So the Spirit of God refuses no one. Is in all the nations. For all the peoples. Because nations are made by language, culture, ancestry, attitudes, and beliefs. 
In 1 Kings chapter 8, who's in church? Come on. You learning something? 1 Kings chapter 8. So everyone I see is a candidate for the temple of God. Everyone. 1 Kings chapter 8. This is Solomon building the temple. See what he says. Verse 26. Oh, now God of Israel, let thy word, I pray thee, be verified. Which thou speak unto thy servant David, my father. Let's take 27 together. Will God indeed dwell on the earth? Behold the heaven, and heaven of heavens cannot contain thee. How much less this house that I have built. Can you see it? They never were saying God was there in there. No. It was always an illustration. Like Moses did. Now look at what he says. 26, 27. Now, pay attention to verse 38. He spoke about how Israel will come and pray in that place. Look at 38. Let's take 38 together and slowly. What prayer and supplication whoever is made by who? Any man! Or by the by people of Israel. Without shall know every man the plague of his own heart and spread forth his hands towards this place. It's a place for any man. Look at verse 43. And thou, there thou in heaven, thy dwelling place, not this house, and do according to all the stranger caused to thee for, for all the people of the earth may know thy name, to fear thee, and as do thy people Israel, that they may know this house, that our beauty is called by on It's a place to welcome thee. Hallelujah. To welcome strangers. Hallelujah. Who's following this? Come on. So Jesus said, this house shall be a house of prayer for all nations. And when did this happen? In the resurrection. Go into all the world. Are you there? And preach the gospel to every creature. So when he says, he breathed on them and said, receive ye the spirit. That is God's call to the nations of the earth. A spirit amongst us. So when we are here like this, we are a small picture of the big picture. The first thing we need to realize, every one of us here, we are qualified for the ministry of the spirit. God gives his spirit to sinners, not perfect men. Can you see it? Can you see? So when you see that fellow who is in our drugs, that fellow who is a Muslim, that fellow who is an atheist, God has given his spirit to him. As he received the spirit, that is why you are preaching. That is where you are sharing the gospel. The spirit amongst us is not just a meeting the spirit amongst us is God's work in the whole earth. So in 1 Corinthians 3.16, Paul says, you are the temple of the Holy Ghost, referring to a gathering. You are the temple of the Holy Ghost. Nahos, the exact Hebrew word that captures, the Greek word, sorry, that captures the word temple. In Ephesians 2.19, so, as we are here, as we gather here, is this the house of God? Huh? But should this remain the only house of God? That means we are gathering to expand. Come on. Come on. So, what is the Spirit's passion right now? To what? Expand. He dwells here to expand. Hallelujah. 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 Are you learning something? He dwells here to expand. Seat at my right hand. You remember that? You remember that? Ephesians 2, 19. So when we go and preach the gospel, we are making invitations of the Spirit. Ephesians 2. Now you are no more strangers and foreigners. Hallelujah. 
You can see Paul is reading from all those texts. Can you see? You are no more strangers and foreigners. In fact, Paul says that that middle wall of partition that separated the Jew and the Gentile, the building of the tabernacle, temple, he said Jesus came and he tore them into pieces. He removed, when Paul says, he took away that middle wall of partition. Paul is reading into the four gospels where it was said that the veil of the temple ran from top, top to bottom. What is Jesus saying? The presence of God is for everybody. It's for the smoker, right? It's for the harlot, right? It's for the gay. Not that they will remain gay after. It's for the homosexual. It's for the idol worshiper. The spirit amongst us. Right? It's, it carries the passion of God. It says you are no more strangers. But you are you fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. And are built upon the foundation of apostles sorry, and prophets. Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. In whom all the building fitly faith together grows into what? And holy temple in the Lord. Let's take 22 together. In whom you also are built together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. Hallelujah. First Peter 2, verse 5. Let's begin to close gradually. First Peter 2 and verse 5. You learning some? You learning some? You also, as living stones, are built up a spiritual house. An holy priesthood to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Are we supposed to remain that way? We're supposed to keep expanding. Right? Till he makes all his enemies his sustu. So God, God's indwelling is the temple of God. Exodus 29, 45. And the Spirit is amongst us today. So which means anywhere, there is nowhere that we cannot find the manifestation of God's presence. Let me close here. The Spirit of God, therefore, is in the church, but not an exclusive preserve for the church. The Spirit of God is in the church or the world. Hallelujah. And so, the Spirit of God, through us, keeps making an invitation. An invitation to the whole world. I don't have all the time, but let me say this. The temple of God has no class. Moral, immoral, male, female, Jew, gender, rich, not rich. No. Temple of God means everyone is welcome. If everyone is welcome, that means God will use anyone. Is that clear now? Is that clear? Come on. To walk through anyone. I see by the eyes of God's spirit that the unlikely, the unworthy will be found doing great and mighty works in the days that we're in. I, I see that those who before now disqualify themselves will open their eyes and by his spirit see the spirit amongst us the days we're in, God will move in unlikely places. They are only unlikely to us because of our mindsets. But they are not unlikely to him. You will find people of different culture, languages, in different places, all over the world. Walk in the gifts of the Spirit. Walk in the power of God. Walk in the glory of God. Because it's the Spirit amongst the nations of the world. Hallelujah. You know, what binds us together is not how we dress. 
is not the language we speak. It's the Spirit of God in all the earth. I'll continue from here next week. Were you blessed? Stand to our feet and lift our hands and we'll worship Him.